Good afternoon, GRA members, and Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024. We are proud to present, this is the first episode of Real Talk for the New Year. Joining us today are GRA CEO Mike Barr, new 2024 GRA President Marvet Artist, and our very special guest, 2011 NAR President Ron Phipps. Welcome, everyone. Great to be with you. Great to be here. This is directed to Ron. I would like to know your feeling on why Realtors Matter and the importance of communicating Realtor value. So the fact of the matter is that we, for more than 100 years, have provided incredible value to consumers. And we've done it as the industry has changed and evolved, we've adapted to what consumers have needed and wanted. And it's one of the reasons why the majority of consumers engage realtors to represent them, whether selling, buying, leasing, uh, being tenants. What I do think that we, we've gotten um, carefree, and maybe the word would be lazy, in our ability to articulate our value. And for the last 50 years, Articulation of value has been something we just haven't focused on because we were so busy doing the transactions and we got paid. We didn't really pay attention to, gee, how do we explain our value? The events of the last three or four years have really required that we re-engage the conversation. What that means is the best agents are very effective at meeting with consumers and saying, look at Here's what I do. Here's the value I bring. Here's how this value positively impacts you as a consumer. Part of the challenge, too, is we do things that are just stupid. They're not in our members' best interest. I love the agents that on Facebook say, I listed a house on Friday. I had an open house on Sunday. We had 25 people through. We have three offers. And it was an agreement on Monday. And the suggestion was that we were able to effectuate a sale in less than 72 hours. And the fact of the matter is that belies everything. Number one, when you hire me, you're getting more than 40 years of experience. So there's an efficiency in my experience that treasures you as the consumer. Consumers need us to bring expertise. They they need competence. They need effectiveness. But they also want us to help them save time. And when we do that well, then we're of value. But we put in the media, particularly in social media, hey, we did this, and the consumer looks and says, well, shoot, you get paid a lot of money for a little effort. That belies everything. Very often when I'm teaching, I'll ask a class, I'll say, okay, how many specific behaviors are involved in a residential listing from first contact to post-closing follow-up? And in the room, these are leaders. I'll get you know, 25, 30 items, 40 items. And I'm looking at him going, okay, wait a minute. You guys are the best and the brightest. And you don't know. And they're like, oof. Now, our list that is from my micro company is somewhere between 180 and 200 specific behaviors on the listing side. And typically between 90 and 120 on the buy side. Now, I will tell you a quick funny story on that too. But we need to do a better job of saying, look, I don't need to do all of these things. But my company works on an independent business decision of the broker to work on a success fee. If we're successful, we get paid. If we're not, if I don't sell the house, I don't get paid. I can't think of anything that is pro-consumer as a success fee or a contingent fee. I pay attention to that to say, okay, if I'm successful, I get paid. Oh, and by the way, success is buyer, seller, lender, appraiser, insurer, home inspector, mother-in-law, 16-year-old, and dog all have to think it's good. And then we get into agreements, then we go through the conditions, then we get to closing. We've got to do a better job of articulating what it is we do to get paid. And that's just on the listing side. So I'll pause on that. Uh, One footnote on the buy side. I was talking with a friend of mine, a long-term client, 20 years ago when she moved to Rhode Island, they hadn't sold their house in McKinney, Texas. So it took them six months to sell the house, and every Friday I would show her three houses. In the course of six months, I showed Michelle DeWine and Rick DeWine more than 90 houses before they bought the house that I had shown them in the first week. 
Okay, they eliminated it the first week, but 90 houses later, said, that wasn't so bad. But it took me 90 houses to earn my success fee. We've got to be confident in the value we bring, but we have to be masters at articulating it. That's our challenge. I am convinced that there is a place for us as practitioners in the future, in a big way, provided we continue to bring that value and we bring the value that consumers need, not what we think they want. And I do think that distinction is something we have to stay focused on as well. At the end of the day, those realtors that really learn how to best articulate their value, they'll crush it. Ah, one other thing. Notice the press the last two weeks. Uh, Consumer Federation of America made a big deal about the fact that half of our members, our residential members, um, only, didn't sell any houses this year. And two-thirds of our members sold less than three sites. We can be more transparent. And I always say to sellers, look at, ask anyone you're interviewing, how much, give, give the addresses of the properties you've sold. That's a fair question. The other footnote is we need to celebrate the best among us and make sure that the best among us are acknowledged for what they're doing because at the end of the day, they're effective and successful because they are delivering what consumers want. So Ron, you know, as far as education is concerned, you got a lot of, a lot of folks who have been on autopilot. Yeah. Um, and and what, what kind of things do you think that the average agent needs to refresh themselves on as far as the education side? What kind of classes? Okay. I love the question because the fact of the matter is I think we need to go back to basics. I think um, we've got to remember that our consumers have been watching HGTV and Million Dollar Listing, et cetera, and they think that's the way the business works. And that's just not the way the business works. So going back to those fundamental courses about those raw skills, even the people who have been doing as long as I have, I go back and look and say, wait a minute, I've gotten sloppy. I've, I'm stepping over this particular discussion with sellers that really helps them understand what our process is. Um, you know, we were talking about the fact that my customers and clients are involved in conversations as to how I'm paid. And I used to just say, here's what it is. It wasn't a discussion. I think part of the education is going back to explain how is the money allocated? Who gets what? What is the dynamic? Um, and a, genuine conversation about the true negotiability of that say look at you you have choices um I, I think that the direct answer to the question is learning how to best articulate value is probably the most important thing but what's very apparent are the skill sets that you develop through the designations will differentiate you in compensation and frankly will move you from surviving to thriving so whether it's um, ABR, whether it is um, CRS, I mean, there, we've got so many great designations. But there's another piece to it, Michael. The people who've had like the CRS designation, like me, for more than 25 years, it is the enhanced classes that are offered today that need to be acknowledged rather than simply having the designation. The designation mm -hmm. says you achieve the threshold, but it is the new material, the new course programming that needs to be part of the skill sets and the knowledge I bring that I think a lot of us got lazy with. COVID should have been a time for us to really hone our skills and spend more time studying. And we spent more time saying, how do I look in the box? And it was just <laughs> weird. It was like, I, and the other thing about the box is we could turn off the box and do other things. And it's like, okay, we had this incredible opportunity that we probably didn't use as wisely as we could have to do some amazing things to hone our skills. What I smile at is I know that we as entrepreneurs will figure it out. And, you know, Marvette is across the table. If we were working the same market area, she would make me a better realtor because she's going to make me that much more effective. And that competition serves consumers really, really well. Because she's going to come up and say, hey, there's a better way for me to do this. I'm going to see that. Because, okay, I think that's good, but I'm going to do one better. And who's the winner? The consumers. And that's really what we need to make sure we focus on. One other footnote. I had a client who was an accountant. And I gave him the list of the 200, at that time it was 202 specific behaviors I did in the transaction. He's an accountant. So he went through and highlighted 162 of my list of 200. 
102. So he wrote back to me and said, Ron, you didn't do these 40. And I wrote back to him and I said, no, I, I didn't. And he said, well, I'd like to adjust your compensation structure basically because you did 70, I think he figured 78%, so I'd like a discount. I said, okay, um, Tom noted, I work on a success fee. I got, was successful, we got it. Oh, and by the way, I got you more money than it was listed at. I said, Ron, I'm an accountant. So I always say to people when we're teaching them to talk about the specifics, say, look, I may need to do all these, I may need to do more. But at the end of the day, you know, there's going to be a discussion as to what's the value I bring to the table. It's not hard. And the other footnote, and it's kind of an important footnote, these are challenging times where challenging times present opportunities. And I'm excited about the potential for us to not merely respond to the challenges but to lean into the future and beyond them. There's some real opportunity for us to write a different and brighter future, not just for us as practitioners, but for home ownership, for sustainable home ownership, for the idea that shelter is a national priority and a human need. That's our charge, that's who we are. And that to me is exciting. Is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know? when it comes to being a realtor, educating yourself, realtor I, value. I, I think there's a really good thing. I think that um, there's a whole bunch of criticism of the National Association of Realtors, um, what's going on in real time. We, there's legitimate criticism. But at the end of the day, when you look at an organization that's been around for more than 100 years, whose genesis, whose first breath was helping protect consumers. We've remained consistent to that purpose for more than 100 years. I love the code of ethics because the code of ethics is behavioral. It tells consumers, how. here's how I'm gonna treat you as a buyer, as a seller, here's how I'm gonna collaborate with my competitors who are collaborative in the industry. It's not simply, um, you know, that golden rule of treat others as you wish to be treated. It's much more tactical and strategic and behavioral. I would encourage our members that when they're doing marketing presentations, having a list of the specific behaviors they may want to do, helpful. But sharing the code of ethics with consumers to say, this is going to guide my behavior. Know that everything I'm doing on your behalf is being disciplined and structured by this document that defines what my behavior should be. Hold me to this standard. We take so much of the resources of the association for granted and we don't use them. And when I look at our role as advocators, our role in government, our role to make shelter a deliverable and to celebrate what it is to be a citizen that's the essence of who we are. And I'll conclude with an observation. When Hamilton and Jefferson were writing the Declaration of Independence, they talked about three inalienable rights. They talked about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Well, Jefferson wanted to play because when Hobbes and Locke originally wrote about it, it was life, liberty, and property. Now, when I say that, people say, wow, that sounds like really material. But it was strategic. They understood that those rights would determine whether the country would survive. So fast forward when you look at the fact that the average American family that now owns a home has a family net worth of $400,000 and the average family that doesn't own a home that are renters has a family net worth of roughly $5,000. Homeownership is a wonderful vehicle and tool to encourage people to be self-reliant, regardless of what your political perspective is, right? It's having people being able to take care of themselves is important. We are practitioners, we are provocateurs of encouraging that home ownership dynamic. Clearly we're committed to it being sustainable, but I look at it and say, we're building a stronger America by encouraging home ownership and we're allowing opportunities for people to celebrate independence, self-reliance, and create multi-generational wealth. 
that's who we are. We've got a lot to celebrate, There's plenty to criticize. The question I would ask your members is when we're asking how do we do better, it's how do we do better, not do we do what do we do wrong. We understand what we did wrong. The question is how do we do better? Help us do better as an industry, help us do better in our individual engagement with customers and clients. If we ask that question and we deliver on that criticism and respond accordingly, there's a bright future. Today is a rainy day in Greensboro, but tomorrow it's gonna have sun. That's the nature of real estate going forward. So just one last question, Ron, we are the envy of the world as far as real estate you know, industry is yeah. concerned. Everybody's coming to the U.S. to learn our model, yep. how we do it. Why? What? What the heck's going on out there? I mean, just just yeah, just, just from a fifty thousand square feet. You know, like why in the world? Or why is why are we like? It seems like we're coming from within. People are coming at us from within the country. Um, it's it's, it's I, crazy. I, I, I have a hard time of understanding the motivation. Um, it, you know, it's funny. I was in um, Greece 12 years ago or 14 years ago, and there was a guy who was trying to help organize real estate in the Ukraine. Um, his name was Arthur. And Arthur came to him and said, Gee, Ron, we're really following the American model. It works really, really well, but we're having a hard time getting paid. And I said, Well, take me through the transaction. And he took me through the transaction. He said, Well, after we close, we then send invoices to the respective parties to pay. And I'm going, Excuse me, you, you send invoices after it's closing's happened? He goes, yeah. And I go, well, we do it at closing. He goes, what do you mean? I said, at the closing table, it's all transparent. It's all negotiated up front. There are negotiations. But our CD, our closing statement has, here's what the buyer's agent's getting, here's what the seller's agent's getting, and it's paid from that corpus of money at the closing table. He goes, that's brilliant. And I said, Arthur, I would love to take credit for it. But we have a market that's evolved over 100 years and there are things that work and things that don't work. That's the nature of it. The fact of the matter is right now, we are in a time of change and a time of challenge. And the fact of the matter is we can't rely on nostalgia and the way it's been done. So if you ask me what's wrong, I, th I think we've become complacent and we haven't articulated our value. The nature of the industry, it adapts. This feels like a toboggan that's about to hit a tree, but the fact of the matter is the toboggan can turn and miss the tree, but we wanna make sure that we have a soft landing and that's really what we need to figure out. I think when you look at the lawsuits, you gotta remember that the lawsuits fundamentally are about money and about compensation. And in the first lawsuit, the argument was that realtors brought no value to any of the consumers in Missouri over five years. And the second suggestion was that all of us, none of us negotiated fee, which is just outrageous. The third thing that was troublesome is the suggestion that for the seller's perspective that if there was no compensation to buyers, agents, that their houses would have sold. Uh, not likely, but that was the assumption in the court. And the second thing is they would have saved whatever that compensation was. And you look at all of it and go, okay, um, I took a course in college. It was a, a freshman introductory psychology course. All of those belie, uh, belie human nature. We've got some challenges to work through. I think if we continue to connect with consumers in a real way, articulate our value and deliver on that value, we're gonna be sailing through some rough storms right now. But I also know that when we compete and collaborate together, we can deliver that superior experience. I'm comfortable we'll be doing that. Uh, these are challenging times and I don't wanna minimize that, but I'm excited um, that Marvetta is taking over because what's important in leadership is to have practitioners, people who are actually out in the field. And she understands in real time what consumers are saying, et cetera, so she can lead from that knowledge base. That helps us tremendously. And that's really the other piece. Her most important responsibility is one working through the storm, but the second most important thing is identifying future leaders. And we really want an extended invitation to people who are hearing this podcast, who are saying, hey, it doesn't matter. Say, wait a minute, it does. And we have the opportunity of being authors and architects of our future. We need you as practitioners to step up and volunteer for leadership so we have practitioners 
that are writing that story. People who did the business 20 years ago who haven't sold the house in 10 years, I, I value them and I treasure them and I appreciate their institutional knowledge. But the people making the important decisions need to be practitioners knowing we know what's going on now. What I'm doing in a transaction today is radically different than I was 10 years ago. Oh, by the way, I'm old enough to remember having an MLS book where the most important MLS decision was in black and white pages whether there were six listings on the page or nine. That was a catastrophic decision. And you look down and say, technology makes us better, but at the end of the day, it is the relationships with the consumers that are our safe harbor and our future. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you flying in um, and you know being a part of the luncheon. Marvette, congratulations on being our new GRA president. And Mike, thank you so much for organizing the podcast today. So yeah, a- anyway, everyone, thank you for listening. This is our first episode of GRA Real Talk of the new year. We look forward to bringing you the next one. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.